So good morning to you. The topic that uh, we have chosen is a basic topic, bending, hmm? flexure in beams. We are usually introduced to this, to this topic in a third semester course in mechanics of materials. It's a very simple basic topic, but it's a topic that is not uh, well understood by many people. I understand that most of you sitting out there are third semester students, but there are also fifth semester and seventh semester students. In the audience here, we have uh, MTech students also. There are teachers also out there. I think it's nice to have a refresher on this very simple topic. I'll be spending six hours with you, three sessions, three lectures. And as you can see on the screen, today's session will be introductory. Then we'll have the second session on deflected shapes, bending moments, and shear force diagrams. Fundamental. I want to comment here that many of us are good in drawing bending moment and shear force diagrams, but bad in also drawing deflected shapes and connecting the deflected shape to the bending moment diagram. And I want you to learn to do that. I want you to understand deflections. I want you to know that deflections are easy to understand because you can see them. Bending moments you cannot see. Shear forces you cannot see. So our brain has two halves, we are told. The left hemisphere is logical. It analyzes. It can deal with abstract concepts. The right brain is more direct, more intuitive. So you actually can draw the deflected shape with your right brain and your bending moment and shear force diagram with the left half of your brain. But you need to integrate both. And in a way, this really helps us in developing our analytic and synthetic skills. Then the third session will be on a special topic, uh, the conjugate beam method. What you see here is the cover page of a book I wrote some years back. In India, it's published by Narosa. Uh, in the Western world, by Alpha Science. So the title of the book is simple, Structural Analysis, uh, published by Narosa. So today's session, we begin with introduction. And the topics are, what is a beam? How do you define it? What are the supports, loads? How is a beam stable and unstable? What are the deformations in beams? Deflections, slopes, curvatures? What loads act on a beam? External loads, which we call as forces, moments. What are the reactions that come at the supports in a beam? How do you calculate them? By using simple equilibrium. And finally, there are also hidden internal forces in the beam which we call shear force and bending moment. What does it really mean? What is the physical meaning? How do you calculate them? So this is an introductory session. We begin with the introduction to the beam. Probably the earliest beam that man came across was when he had to cross a stream and a fallen log of wood was there and he stepped over it and crossed primitive. Today we call that a bridge. And what you see here is a simple bridge. And when you walk on across it, it will bend. So a beam, the simplest definition of a beam is a structural element that resists loads by bending. A beam is a skeletal structural member which resists loads by bending. What is the meaning of skeletal? Anyone? Skeletal. We have a skeleton. On that, the flesh is clad. What is the property of a skeletal element? Also called the line element when we model it. All elements are three-dimensional, but for convenience, we model some elements as line elements. A beam can be modeled as a line element, a skeletal element. So a skeletal element is an element whose 
cross sectional dimensions are small compared to its length very simple all the bones are like that a beam is like that and what is bending what is bending simple question anyone in fact the whole topic is bending in beam so we should it's natural to ask what is a beam and next question what is bending kind of question you can be asked in an interview so i hope this course will help you at least answer that question what is bending anyone 24 colleges out there one answer okay our students here anybody what is bending dipti okay good excellent answer so our iit students are able to give the answer uh, bending is simply a change in curvature so i've got two footnotes here on the screen skeletal means small cross section compared to length bending means change in curvature very easy to remember something which was initially straight when it subject to loading it will become curved it will have a curvature that's the essential meaning of bending so again the definition is based on what you can see but another way to look at it is to talk in terms of what you cannot see and that is it resists loads by developing bending moments and shear forces we'll try to understand all that here's a nice pretty picture of a little guy on a bridge and when he sits on it what will happen it will undergo a change in curvature and very easy to hmm? that's what happened but we we don't want to live in buildings where they deflect so much so all the beams that we actually design uh, should not bend so much they will bend but we are also sensitive to movement so they should not bend too much so we restrict the deflection in the beam by designing the beam by proportioning the beam. and we also want the beam to not break not collapse so we want to make the beam strong we need to develop what is called flexural strength in the beam so basically these are the two points to understand deflections slopes curvatures they all belong to a family called deformations and bending moments and shear forces which belongs to the family of forces so here is a model of that skeletal element okay it's a line element it's a beam if i put a vertical load on it it's fine i just need to have restraint against the movement downwards like those two boulders out there but if i have a slight horizontal component to the load then that beam can slide and so the minimum support requirements are vertically it should not it should be stable so two support conditions there that prevent movement downwards and horizontally at least one end should be held and this is the classic simply supported condition what you see on the left hand is called a hinge support what you see on the right hand is called a roller support and more conventionally we draw this picture a hinge where free rotation is possible but translation is not possible either vertically or horizontally and on the right side vertically you don't want translation but horizontally you can allow it and that's why we put a roller so this is a stable beam it can resist external loads by developing internal forces called bending moments and shear forces and by undergoing change in curvature very simple introduction to the beam don't go away with the understanding the beam is a horizontal member we might get the impression from these pictures no beam can be inclined beam can be even vertical hmm? the definition is it will resist loads by undergoing change in we saw a simply supported beam now let's look at another simple beam it's called a cantilever beam something that's sticking out 
from a fixed support. So, we can draw it this way. A, B is the B. At the end A, you have freedom. It can translate, it can rotate. B, it is arrested. It can't translate or rotate. It's said to be fixed. So, we saw earlier a roller support, a hinge support. Now, you can see a simple fixed support. Very simple. Now, let's put some load on the B. Okay. You can see some books have been put on that. So, I have a beam AB. I am putting a load, a concentrated load at C. And what will happen? It will have a change in curvature. I want to add that it is elastic, which means, it's, we call it an elastic curve, the deflected profile, which means if I remove the load, it will come back to its original position. That is elastic behavior, we know that. Now, if you look carefully at that deflected shape ACB, all of it is not going to be curved. Some part of it will be actually straight. Anyone? Which part will be straight and which part will be curved? The question I am asking is, we said that a beam with this external loads by undergoing change in curvature. We saw in the earlier case a simply supported beam which was totally bent. Now, we have a cantilever beam and the load is kept somewhere, not at the free end, but somewhere away from it at C. I am asking a question. Is the whole portion ACB curved, undergoing change in curvature, or is there some straight part of it which remains straight? Anybody? Chat, okay. Part very near to the support that is at, okay, right. I would like to see the screen also, either there or here. Right. A part very close to the support will not bend. Ah. There is some truth in what you say, but you got it all wrong. At B, actually the curvature is maximum. Though it looks like it has not moved, it has maximum curvature B and actually minimum curvature at C and at A. And we will show this to you. A, C actually does not bend at all. C B bent. At B you have the maximum curvature or the minimum radius of curvature. We will explain those terms, but I am glad you give the, gave the answer. At B the slope is 0. Now we are bringing another term. The rotation is 0, but the curvature is maximum. At A, AC will remain straight because that part is not loaded at all. It is free to move like a rigid body. It will just move because BC is moving is to tag along and AC will just move along like a rigid body. AC remains straight. See? And even when you draw it, you must draw AC straight, CB curved. And there is a changing radius of curvature. We will see all that later. The curvature is infinite. Sorry, the radius of curvature is infinite because AC is straight and then slowly it becomes finite and at B it becomes the smallest. We will see all that. So, these are called deflection and slopes. Deflection I show as delta, delta A, delta C and slope I show, show here as theta A and theta C. That means, if you draw the original location with which original line was horizontal, it is now inclined. You can have theta A, theta C. You can also talk of delta B and theta B, but clearly the boundary conditions are such that delta B and theta B are 0. So, when you said something is 0, you were right, but that will not curvature. It is deflection and slope. So, the question that we would like to know is how much did it deflect at the free end A? What was the rotation? And maybe what is happening at C also? These are good questions, geometry questions, which we can answer in structural analysis. And we have something called compatibility, which relates slopes and deflections at different points in the beam. 
and you can see that because a c remains straight, theta a will be equal to theta c. And since these deformations are small, you can approximate tan theta to be equal to theta. You can show that delta a, the maximum deformation at the free end a, will be delta c plus an additional deflection which can be obtained as a, a is the distance between a and c, a uh, and into tan theta which is simply theta. So, you got delta a equal to delta c plus theta a theta c, very simple calculation. But what is delta a, what is theta a is something that we will learn in this lecture that we will come across. Here another good picture. Happy people jumping, knowing the risk of jumping on a outcrop of rock and it looks a bit scary, doesn't it? But it's safe. So that's what it looks like. You got so earlier we talked of simply supported beam, then we talked of cantilever beam. Now we got a simply supported beam kind of with an overhang. The overhang part looks like a cantilever. And these people, so it has its own self weight, and you have those three people jumping on top of it. When they land on it, hopefully it will remain stable. But let's say one, we bring in one more guy, heavy guy, mm. suited and booted, and put him at the tip of that rock. Now you should be a little scared. Why? What will happen? Ah, it could just lift off, the whole thing could overturn, all of them could come crashing down. That's risky. So this is unstable. This is the danger of instability. Now you are engineers out there, and how will you make sure that, and such things can happen, as engineers we should design for the worst conditions. How will you make sure that People can safely do whatever they want anywhere on that rock. What to do? How to make it stable? How to make the system stable? Anybody, how to make it safe? Okay, now let me give you um, a classic you know, mathematical analytical solution. What we need is this, okay? That means we need a support which can take uplift because it's going to lift up. Someone, something should hold it down. It's nice to draw a picture like this, and you might get books showing pictures like this. But how do you do it in practice? How do you make sure it's going to work? How do you make sure that the plank does not lift up from the support? You get it? How to do it? Any suggestions out there? And this is a stone age, you have only stones there. What will you do? Simple answer. Chat, okay. Making fix at left support. Are Baba, how do you make it fixed? I have only stones available. You are giving me theoretical solution. I want practical solution. Yes. A nice question. See, the whole subject is so interesting. Put heavy stone at the left side. Very good. Who said that? Who said that? Are you some individual raise your hand. I want to see you. Who said that? Anyway, the answer is brilliant. Brilliant. You will make good engineers, guaranteed. Hmm? So let we we'll go back to the slides. Go back to the slides. So, you said the right thing, put one heavy weight there, that is called a counterweight. That weight will make sure it will not lift up. Brilliant answer and solution. Now you know everything about beams. Let us continue. We we'll talk of a next type of beam, which is continuous beam. So, see what all we did. Simply supported beam, cantilever beam. Simply supported beam with something sticking out that is called an overhang and next category is continuous beam. You see that, that looks like the stone hinge. Uh, 
the vertical pillar and big block of stone. We sometimes see this in old temples and all that. So this is continuous. This beam is continuous over so many vertical supports, and you can make it model it like this. Okay, to make it stable, one of those supports should not move. Should be hinged. Hinge is very at least through, through friction, it should not move. And the others can be roller, and you can put loads on it. It will deflect something like that. You can put a concentrated load. Let's say two span. Now we are talking about two span continuous bridge. How will this deflect? In a regular room, make the student come and draw the shape. Now it's not possible. So I leak out the answer to you. It will deflect like that. Now look at what's happened. A B will go down, and it will have a curvature which we call sagging. Sagging doesn't mean going down. Sagging means means having this kind of curvature, and B C will hog. It's called hogging. But because of the continuity at B, some compatibility requirement is to be satisfied. So if you look at the slopes, the con compatibility requirement is the tangent at B must be the same on the left side and the right side. That requirement is theta B A must be equal to theta B C. Just an introduction to these ideas. Continuity must ensure there is compatibility, continuity in the beam, and the deflected shape will show that change in slope. And plus, you get reactions, and it's quite likely that the reaction at C will be an uplift. You can feel that, and this is very important to note because when you when you go to a construction site, be careful when you walk, especially when you walk near the edge, because Often you have a plank which may not be nailed properly, and so it can lift up, and it could be disrupted. So check out these boundary conditions. Okay, then you have something also equilibrium. The total load must be balanced, so P must be equal to the sum of all the reactions. Next, we look at a cantilever bridge. Now we are talking of bigger structures, more interesting structures. I've got two beams with overhangs, and I can actually increase my span. And sometimes I need to do this. Let's say in C, in deep C, it's difficult to cast uh, pairs. So I will like to have a large span, and I can do that by dropping down a span which is called a suspended span. Look at that; very interesting. So the end spans are called anchor spans. Then you have a cantilever arm, which is an overhang, and then you have a suspended span. This is how bridges are done. They are all beams, and you can model it like this. Now you are more comfortable. At the junction between the cantilever span and the suspended span, you have something called an internal hinge. Internal hinge is badly understood by most students, so we'll spend some time on internal hinge, but. Let's just look at the overall behavior. Let's say there's a vehicle on top that will be modeled as two loads where the wheels are acting, and you have many options. Large spans are more economically covered by trusses, so you can have a truss bridge instead of a beam. Right. Now let's look at internal hinge. Okay. Here is a question to you. I have a a, a beam AC. With an internal hinge at B, okay, beam AC with an internal hinge at B. I can also look at it as two interconnected beams AB and BC with an internal hinge at B. What is this internal hinge? So I have a question for you. If I put the load P in the middle of BC, what will be my reaction at C? I am putting the load P exactly in the middle of BC. What is my reaction at C? Anybody? So we'll we'll try to understand that the beam is going to deflect. We don't know how. Let's assume it's deflecting like that. It's very interesting because A B shows a hogging behavior like a cantilever, whereas B C is showing a sagging behavior. 
there is a change in slope at B, but the deflections are the same at B. Now, this is easiest understood by saying that if you separate out A, B, and C, B, C is dependent on A, B for its stability. You know B, C, A, B can still stand. A, B doesn't need the help of B, C. And sometimes to make us understand this more easily, we refer to A, B as a parent. Parent doesn't depend on the child. But the infant, the child, needs the support of the parent for its own survival. So you should be able to know when you have two interconnected beams, in a manner of speaking, which beam is resting on which beam. And this picture, this shows the meaning of that internal hinge. And it's much easier to understand. Let's separate them out. So the detail of the internal hinge, when you make it, should be modeled like this. Because you can see clearly that this projection in BC shows that this is going to rest on AB. So this is hidden. Only good engineers can see what's going on. The common man will just look at this and see just one beam out there. But actually, there's a, there's a hidden hinge which permits differential rotation at B. But the translation, the deflection will be the same. There will be a force transfer, but not a moment transfer. We'll understand all this later. But if you separate out the two beams, you'll find that AB can stand, BC cannot, BC will actually collapse like that. So if you want to really model the support condition at B in BC, you have to bring in AB there, and the correct support condition is called a spring. A spring has a constant. It's called a spring constant. It's a force per unit deflection. This spring is actually showing the parent. To find the spring stiffness, if you apply a load P and this cantilever deflects delta, then P divided by delta is the spring constant. That's how we replace AB and model it as a spring. And so when I apply this load, it's going to deflect. It's going to have reactions like this. Whatever reaction I get at B will be transmitted as a load to B in the cantilever AB. And I'll get reactions like that. We'll come to that later. But the deflected shape is AB deflects like a cantilever. BC is not simply supported. It's got a roller support at one end and a spring support at the left end. It's going to deflect in a way which we'll see surely. Uh, here, we see a simply supported beam. Now, we see that that support on the left end is going to go down like a spring like a rigid body, and the actual deflection is a superposition of these two fellows. That's a deflected shape. Very intuitively easy to understand. When you join these two, you get it there. What is interesting is the deflection, the compatibility is the deflection at B must be the same for both A, B, and B, C, but the rotation can be different. Very interesting. That's the meaning of internal. And I think most of us, Oops, gone through courses in structural analysis, did not know this. Very important to know this. Let's move ahead. Frames. The frames are not beams, but most buildings don't have simply supported beams. Most buildings have frames. They look like this. Look at that. They are actually three dimensional, but for convenience, we can make them two dimensional. Now, in a 3D frame, it's all monolithic. Usually, it's made of concrete in India. You can also have steel buildings, we give names like beams to the horizontal members and columns to the vertical members, but the reality is both are called frame elements. Okay. In a beam, you talk of bending moment and shear force, but in a frame, you will also get actual tension or compression. Similarly, in a column, the main load is an actual compression, but you can also get bending. Three-dimensional frames Skeletal frames are difficult to analyze, so sometimes we say that the frames in one direction are independent with respect to the other direction, and so we call them plane frames, subject to vertical and lateral loads. Next topic, very briefly. We already have some introductory idea of what is stability, what is rigidity, and what is static indeterminacy. That's a cantilever beam. We know that. It is stable. It's not going to run away. 
it can't move. It can move in the sense it can undergo small changes in geometry. And if it's well designed, you can't see it with the naked eye. But as a rigid body, it can't move. It's, it's fixed at the left end. It's fixed against rotation and translation. This is a cantilever. We also saw simply supported beams are also stable. And we say that these beams are just rigid. We gave it the minimum amount of so-called rigidity to make it stable. And we'll come, we'll discuss this word again. This is said to be statically determinate. Let's say I put a load there. It can resist a load by a change in curvature. It's behaving like a B. Now let me, I've learned how to provide an internal hinge. So let me put one internal hinge on this cantilever. What will happen? Then you'll find that that beam is not well, it's not fair to say the whole beam is not stable. That part beyond the internal hinge is unstable. Part of the beam is unstable. And the proof is if, if I put a load there, it's going to go down. It's unstable. By its own weight, it will go down. So here's an example of a beam which is unstable. Now, let's say I don't put the hinge there. Instead, I put a prop here. It's called a, it's a roller support. This is called a propped cantilever. So the difference between a cantilever and a propped cantilever is you gave an additional support at the free end. You needn't have given it. So we say that we made it little more rigid than the minimum needed for stability. You can say it's over rigid. It's stable. But now there's a problem. See, in the first beam, you could get all the reaction easily. In the prop cantilever, we don't know the support reaction. We'll discover this later. So we say the beam is statically indeterminate to a first degree. So it can take load, but the deflected shape is completely different compared to the cantilever. We need to understand this. Now you put an internal hinge. You're actually bringing a moment release. What's happening now? You are making it just rigid again. This we can analyze. We did it in the previous example. It's, you have a child and a parent. It's easy to analyze this. So when I bring a moment release, that hinge gives me a moment release, I am reducing the rigidity and making it just rigid for stability. And so this is, this can take load. Look at the deflected shape. If I put the load exactly on top of the hinge, then the right side will just move like a rigid body, straight line. That means the entire load will be taken by the parent. Child will not take any load. If I shift the load to the left, same thing will happen. The parent only will take the load. The child will not take the load. If I shift the load to the right, the child will take the load and it will pass on some part of the reaction at the internal hinge to the cantilever, to the parent. Beautiful. And you should be able to draw deflected shapes and understand what, what's going on. Now we increase fixity by providing additional fixity at the right end. We call this a fixed beam, fixed at both ends. And this is again over rigid. You made it more rigid. Later we'll see the degree of static indeterminacy is increased. It can take loads. But look at the deflected shapes. Cantilever deflects in one way. Propped cantilever deflects in another way. Fixed beam deflects in another way. Depends on where the load is applied and the boundary conditions. A quick Definition of static determinacy. In structural mechanics, we use two terms, statics and kinematics. Kinematics is all about deformations. Statics is all about forces. So if you can find the forces easily by just applying equations of equilibrium, which you can get from Newton's laws, then the system is statically determined. And you'll find that you have just rigid systems. That's all that you need. If you make it a little over rigid, you can't find the support reactions and internal forces easily. It becomes statically indeterminate. So there's a link between kinematics and statics. If you make a structure a little more rigid than the minimum needed for stability, you're asking for more analytical ability. And if you look at the history of evolution of structures, 
initially people made all systems just rigid because they could handle it easily they could analyze it easily now let's quickly look at actual strain okay let's take a simple case let me take a rod and put it on a table let's say a smooth frictionless surface let me just increase the temperature of that rod what will happen will i get stress will i get strain i will not get stress because it wants to increase in length and you know that it wants to increase in length let's say there's a uniform increase in temperature t it will become longer let's show it longer there right? and we know how much longer because we've all studied this the elongation will be l alpha t and when we cool it we remove the temperature it will go back to the origin we know that right so there is not going to be a stress there unless i prevent it from elongating but if i allow it to elongate it will just change in length so this we know and if you divide the elongation by the original length you get what is called a thermal strain or an axial strain and the value is alpha t alpha is the coefficient of thermal expansion per degree celsius into t if i cool it so it's a constant strain no no stress. if i cool it the reverse happens minus t it will shrink go back the other way now here the tricky question if i do both hmm, i give it a temperature gradient somehow i heat the top layers or i cool the top layer and heat the bottom layer which means the top wants to shrink and i have a linear temperature gradient minus t to plus t what will be the deformed shape well we are tempted to answer like this right but this is a wrong answer it's a wrong answer because you are violating something what are you violating the cross sectional plane must remain normal to the longitudinal centroidal axis after deformation let me explain let's this center line axis here and let me draw vertical lines those vertical lines must remain at 90 degrees to the centroidal axis so what will be the deformed shape any idea we're running short of time so i'll give you the answer okay what's going to happen let's say it's got a, a rectangular cross section like that what's going to happen and this you can check this out it has to see that ab has to shrink by e which is l alpha t cd has to increase in length by l alpha t and you want the normal planes to remain normal to the centroidal axis there's only one way you can draw it and that way is like this it will curl up it will curl up on its own even if it's on a frictionless surface it will curl up this way and this curvature is what we call sagging curvature whenever you have in the regions elongation and the regions above a contraction this is called sag and you know that ab dash will be l minus l alpha t because l alpha t is the amount it wants to shrink and cd dash is l plus l alpha t and if you look at it you'll find that this is actually going to curl up as a segment of a circle and we can prove it because all these normals if you join they will all converge at one point the tangent drawn at any point on the deformed beam must remain parallel to the longitudinal centroidal axis all normals to such tangents will converge at a point the center of a circle whose radius is r this is normally not taught but i think it's a very important point you must understand why under so called pure bending you will get a deformed shape which is exactly a segment of a circle and the angle subtended there let's say it's theta and if we blow up the uh, diagram of increase in length you'll find that there's a reduction in length of l alpha t at the top fiber 
elongation of L alpha t at the bottom fiber and the angle subtended theta is the same theta that you see out there. And if you want to draw the strain profile, strains are dimensionless, that means alpha t is what you should do with contraction on top and you call it expansion or elongation at the bottom. And if you want to find a value of theta and let us say the movements are very small, theta is approximately equal to tan theta for low values of theta, you will find this is, it is L alpha t divided by A. You will need a little time to digest this. So my suggestion is you replay this eta. We have lots of topics to cover, but I want to finish this portion. So uh, if I talk of the change in angle in my strain profile, I will get alpha t by A, which is theta by L, and that is actually called curvature. That is actually called curvature. We will come to that. So fibers above, let us talk of one layer at a distance y above the center line. The radius of that will be r minus y. And let us say the center line, center line does not want to change in length because you have not changed the temperature of the center line. So that will remain at, so that is a zero strain condition. So at the height y, the strain is the change in length divided by original length, which is r theta minus r minus 1 y theta divided by r theta. You know that. You just have to take the lengths of the arc. That boils down to y by r. You have a minus sign which tells you it is a contraction, not an elongation. Do not use the word tension. Tension has to do with force. Here there are no stresses, no forces. Use the word elongation or expansion. In this case, it is contraction. Minus is contraction. This Ex equal to y by r is a very important concept. It shows that the strain profile is linear across the depth and if you want to find out its value, let us take the extreme y equal to a, the depth of the beam is 2a and you substitute for y, you get a by r and you equate it to alpha t, you get a very beautiful relationship. You could be asked this question in the gate exam. Can you derive a relationship between the radius of curvature and the coefficient of thermal expansion, the increase in temperature and the size of the beam? Very beautiful, simple derivation. And let us go a little further. R theta equal to L. Curvature is 1 divided by radius of curvature. That is a fundamental definition of curvature in mathematics, which in this case will be theta by L. And that is what you see here. That is what you see here. This is that curvature. If you go to the maths class, I presume you have covered all this. That is the definition of curvature is pretty messy, complicated. Huh? But luckily for us, the denominator is can be taken to be 1 because delta itself is small. d delta by dx is even smaller. So if you take the denominator equal to 1, approximately curvature is taken as d squared delta by dx squared and deflection is delta at any location x, it is changing and we have something called slope which is the slope of deflection and the slope of the slope is called curvature, okay, basic concept, slope of the slope is curvature. We will come back to this later but in this one slide we have got many beautiful concepts embedded. We are now ready to go to the third topic, external loads, forces and moments. So we did not go to low, uh, to to loads, we first went to deformation because you can see deformation. Now, what is a force? What is a moment? So, what is a force? I want you to answer. What is a force? How will you define a force? You have to say it in a way that a layman will understand. Don't say in physics we learned this. What is a force? Simple question. Simple question, simple answer. In an interview, you will be asked a question. Force is push or pull which deforms the body. Very good, extremely good, well answered. What happens if the body is rigid? Oh, that is a tricky question, but we will we'll go back to our slide. Good question. Good. A force or action is a push or pull on a body. You added one more line which deforms the body, which is not wrong. In real bodies, there will also be a deformation. Good answer. 
Then now we will go back to physics, Newton's first law, a resultant force on a body at rest or uniform motion causes it to accelerate. F is proportional to ma and if you choose the units properly, F is equal to mass times acceleration. Now we come to what happens if the resultant force is zero? Then we say the body is in a state of rest or uniform motion. That is the definition of static equilibrium. A condition of rest or uniform motion that is resultant force on the body is zero. By the way, nothing is at rest. You might see, feel this mouse is at rest. That's because our frame of reference is at rest. Actually, the mouse is sitting on a table. The table is sitting on a floor of a building. Building is sitting on the planet Earth. The planet Earth is quietly spinning around in its own axis. But fortunately, it's uniform motion. And so our, we are also spinning along, uh, along with it, so we think nothing is moving. That's why Newton was very, very clever when he said this, state of rest or uniform motion. So if our frame of axis is also spinning at this, it's like there's no relative motion, there's no acceleration. Okay, what is the reaction? Very interesting. We bring, bring in Newton's third law. When one body transmits a force by contact with another body. This mouse is it's got weight it's sitting on the table it's transmitting its weight to the table of course the table is transmitting it to the floor we'll just talk talk about this it clearly shows that everything is related to everything else every something is sitting on something so there is a force acting and if i apply a force on top of that then that is transmitting it through the mouse to the table so when one body transmits a force by contact with another body, then the second body reacts by exerting an equal and opposite force on the first body. You must know the difference between Newton's third law and Newton's first law. Very important. Newton's third law is not equilibrium. This is applying a force on this, two different bodies. And Newton's third law says this is also applying an equal and opposite force on this body. The bodies are different. So you can't talk of equilibrium of a body. It's very important. Okay, let's show this. We have a cantilever beam or a cantilever which will subject to an actual force. Cantilever is body A, body B is the support. Let me apply a force P. Then we normally draw a reaction P like that, but actually we should separate out the two bodies to understand what's going on. When we separate out the bodies, we use a word called free body. We are freeing the body from its constraints. So let's free body A and body B and now apply the forces. Now we say if the whole system is in equilibrium, then the free bodies are also in equilibrium. So you have free body A. This force that I show here, P, is a load on that body and this P here is a reaction. But if when I draw a free body, I don't know which is load, which is reaction, I don't need to know. But I know that this body is in equilibrium. Similarly, body B has a P which comes from the inter intersurface connection between these two bodies, equal and opposite and it also has a reaction P. When I join these two, I get this, so I don't show the forces which get neutralized when I join them. So one is A acting on B, the other is B acting on A. Okay. Remember, you gave the correct answer. Force also tends to produce deformation in a body. The answer is very correct. And this force, see, that there won't be deformation if the body is rigid. In terms of strain energy, it won't strain. Strain energy will be zero. So when I apply a load, I will get a stress for sure. I'll get a reaction in internal force, but I need not get a strain. Very important. One. How much strain I will get will depend on the deformability of the body. In a rigid body, which is an idealization, I need not get any strain, but I'll always get a internal force. I'll always get a stress. Stresses which are internal, loads are external. 
stresses are introduced or induced in a body subject to self equilibrating forces like the one I showed you in the free body. And this introduces when that body is pulled like that, it's going to elongate. This induces strains in the body unless it is a rigid body causing it to deform. So that's fundamental. Okay. 